In this video, I'm going to show you how to derive the general relativity corrected Newtonian gravity law. So, normally in non-relativistic mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, the effective gravitational force you're used to consists of an inverse square attractive force and an inverse cube repulsive force that's really an effective force, the centrifugal force. But, of course, that's not the full story. The full story, at least at the non-quantum level, is general relativity and it is famous for yielding a correction that gives the missing contribution to the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. So we expect another term to show up that causes that due to general relativity. And I'm going to show you how to use general relativity to calculate that extra term in order to get the full effective force, the GR corrected Newtonian gravity law. Now strictly speaking, I don't actually bother with the force itself, I write out the potential but they're just related by taking a gradient. So the expression for the GR corrected Newtonian gravity law that I have in the thumbnail and that I'm going to derive here is the effective potential. I'll leave it to you to bother to take the gradient and get the force. So let's get going. So let's get started with this calculation of the general relativistic corrected Newton's gravity law. Einstein's general relativity famously yielded the missing contribution to the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. This contribution is ultimately due to a GR correction term to the effective potential that one normally finds in Newtonian mechanics. So a term beyond what we normally find in Newtonian mechanics. The new potential term is attractive and goes as the inverse cube of the radius, so the force goes as the inverse of the radius to the fourth. Deriving this GR corrected Newtonian gravity law is the goal of this document and therefore this video. The approach taken here for this calculation is the following. First, because we are studying orbits around a spherically symmetric gravitating source at the origin, we must use the Schwarzschild solution. The first step is to derive the equation of motion for the radius of an orbiting test particle as a function of proper time. Because test particles follow geodesics, one way to do this is to use the geodesic equation. Here we will take an easier path that consists of writing down such an equation of motion directly from the line element. One can then consider the action of such a particle in this geometry and from that use Noether's theorem to derive the formulas for two constants of the motion, energy and angular momentum. Using these formulas we can rewrite the equations of motion in terms of the constants of the motion. We can then further rewrite the equation such that all its terms have dimensions of energy. At this point we will be able to read off the effective potential. We will find the two terms that are familiar from non-relativistic mechanics and in addition one that is unique to general relativity, a purely geometric effect that vanishes in the non-relativistic limit. The sum of these three potential terms is the GR corrected Newtonian gravity law. Let's write out that radial equation now. This is the line element of the Schwarzschild metric. Given the spherical symmetry of the geometry, the orbital plane will never change from what it started out as. So one can select the orbital plane to be whatever will simplify the problem the most. In this case, selecting theta to equal pi over 2 simplifies the line element quite nicely down to this. Then we can manipulate this into the radial equation of motion. The first thing I did, and the most critical thing I did, was just dividing by d tau squared, which gives us this. Then I multiplied by 1 minus the Schwarzschild radius over the radius, which got me to this equation. I then added this term here to the other side and subtracted this one to the other side, which gave me this. And then I did some factoring, which gave me this. This is the radial equation the motion we're interested in. It is useful to rewrite this equation in terms of any constants of motion that may exist, and given that this system is invariant under time translation and rotation, energy and angular momentum should be conserved. So if one varies the action with respect to the parameters of those differentiable symmetry transformations of the action, Noether's theorem tells us that we can expect to find constants of the motion, quantities with a zero trajectory parameter derivative, which we have already identified as being the energy and the angular momentum. The definition of such a symmetry transformation dictates that the action remains invariant under the transformation, thus the variation of the action with respect to the parameter of the transformations by definition has to be zero. The proper time maximization property of geodesic trajectories reveals the action to be this. I will consider general variation of this action briefly and then move on to selecting the symmetry parameters to be the azimuthal angle and then the time to derive the angular momentum and energy formulas respectively. As we just established, the definition of a symmetry is that this variation of the action with respect to the symmetry parameter is zero. 
The next task is to calculate the variation of the integrand, which is the Lagrangian. The easiest way to do this is to calculate the variation of the square of the integrand and then solve for the variation of the integrand. That last step I'm going to save for when we're considering specific variations. The square of the integrand is this, which can be rewritten like that, and therefore plugging in the metric gives us this result for it. Then we can use the power rule to take the variation, which just tells us that this thing is equal to this. I did not distribute this in and mess with that yet. We'll do that when we consider a specific parameter. So now let's do that. Let's take the symmetry parameter to be the azimuthal angle to get the angular momentum. The only term that depends on the azimuthal angle is this here, so that's the only term that survives the variation. We can apply the power rule again to get from this term to that term, and then we're free to permute this variation with this derivative, so we have this result. So ultimately we have this equality, which allows us to solve for the variation of the integrand, which is just this. If we substitute that back into the action, we arrive at this which allows us to integrate by parts, and you can see we're getting close to getting the constant of motion. Now remember, the boundary term here as a result of the integration by parts goes to zero because the endpoints of the trajectory are fixed. This causes the variation at the endpoints to go to zero, and of course the boundary term goes to zero if the variation of the endpoints is zero. This integral is supposed to be zero for all integration bounds and for all delta phi, so we ultimately have this equation, and therefore we can see the angular momentum must be that. So now let's switch it up and choose the symmetry parameter to be the time instead of the azimuthal angle so that we get the energy formula instead of the angular momentum formula. The only term that's dependent on the time is this one here, so that's the only term that survives, and again we can use the power rule to get this. We ultimately arrive at this equality with that, and then we can solve for the variation of the integrand of the action, which is just this. So therefore the variation of the action, which must be equal to zero, is just this quantity here. We can then integrate by parts to move this derivative from the delta t over to everything else, which gets us here. Now this should be true for all integration bounds and all delta t, so that implies this equation here, which tells us the energy has to be this. Now let's insert these constants of the motion into the radial equation in order to get it written in terms of them. This is the radial equation as we last saw it. I then multiplied and divided by the necessary factors of mu and c and r in order to get the constants of motion formulas to show up there, and then I substituted them in. Then I multiplied this out. Now we can rewrite this so that all the terms have dimensions of energy, and we can also insert the formula for the Schwarzschild radius. I also use the fact that in this approximation the reduced mass and the test mass are virtually identical, so we ultimately have this answer. We see that there are a number of different types of energy terms here, including three potential terms right here. We see the two effective potential terms that we're familiar with from non-relativistic physics, the gravitational attraction term and the centrifugal term right there. And we also notice this third one here, which has come uniquely out of general relativity, and it is that geometric effect that clearly goes to zero when you take the non-relativistic limit, which is just the limit as c goes to infinity. This is the term that's responsible for the anomalous contribution to the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. If we take the sum of all three of them, we get the complete effective potential of the Schwarzschild geometry. So that is how you derive the general relativistic correction to Newton's gravity law. So now you know how to start with the Schwarzschild metric and use it to derive the general relativistic correction to the Newtonian gravity law. So if you've ever been in classical mechanics class and they said, well, the gravitational effective potential is this quantity plus GR corrections, they didn't tell you what the GR correction was. Now you know. That's the answer to the question. I hope you enjoy. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Dietrich out.